if he gets pumped up like I do when I hear that opening riff right there. They played Ribfest this week, and everyone and their brother hit him up for backstage passes. We'd like to welcome from Sticks. it's James Young. J.Y., I, just for the record, I did not ask for tickets this week. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pete. <laughs> How you doing, my friend? I'm absolutely phenomenal. You've always told me it's very hard. You love doing Chicago, but it's very hard because everybody calls you because they want tickets and they want backstage passes, and it's more work when you're in town than out of town. Well, the uh, particularly the Naperville Rib Fest, which is something I resisted performing at for many years, but it's, it's for a very good charitable cause, and we played there for the first time two years ago, and they raised at least two $3 million for uh, num- numerous hospital charities in the greater Chicago area, and it's 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 run by volunteers, so it's not nearly as tightly run a ship as, unfortunately, some of the downtown, uh, you know, like a, a proper pro- concert promoter would do. But for us, it's, it's a great way to, people pay 10, 15 bucks to get in, and we had, I think, 40000 there, then they started turning people away. And that's a great place for some people who can't afford a big ticket show to come see a great rock show be part of it and and for us to get exposed to people that maybe have never seen the band before and so uh it's a great thing to do well it's such a huge festival now i mean naperville is what the third largest city in illinois maybe the second well it goes back and forth with rockford it's either second or third yeah and uh so i mean it's it there's a huge contingent of humanity there but it also i think really draws from farm country where people you know, we don't want to drive all the way downtown because it's too far because it's really about an hour from downtown from Naperville to downtown. But, right. you know, it really would draw from farm country where people can almost go to the Mississippi River and still get there maybe an hour and a half to, uh, to Naperville. So. It's funny. My sister lives uh, right off Weber Road, and I always tell her when she invites us over, it's like driving to Iowa from downtown because it takes forever. It right. Take, it takes forever, man. <laughs> Now, I know that you tour, you know, every single 4th of July and summertime, you know, you're touring nonstop. It's night after night. But, you know, when you think back, back in the day when you were growing up, like 13, 14 years old, you know, what did you do around the 4th of July? Because it's, you know, that's midsummer right there. That means it's midsummer and you got a half left and then you're back to school. Well, I mean, uh, we're a traditional American family. We'd uh, get out the barbecue grill and uh, get some ground meat of whatever farm animal happened to be available at the time and <laughs> grill it on up and put it on some mustard and onion and burgers, and uh, now you're talking. Uh, do you put ketchup on your hamburger? I do not. Uh, do you, you put ketchup on your hot dog? I do not. Of course not. You're from Chicago. Mustard, I'm a mustard and onions guy. Mustard and onions. I love it. You know, I have, uh, I have an 8-year-old now. He just turned 8, and I told him when he turns 9 years old, I, I told him, I said, Charlie, that's it. You can't have ketchup on your hot dog anymore. He's like, Dad, I know. <laughs> that that is the rule man that is the rule we're talking to uh che y from sticks and every once in a while kevin cronin checks in and kevin's love for chicago and the way that he reminisces about growing up in chicago that's what i love about him and that's what i love about you because you guys never forget your roots and i love the fact that you guys go on tour together every once in a while well um we were sort of Rivals back in the, in the heyday, back in the late 70s and early 80s, and REO really was out of the gate uh, long before we were and uh, managed to sort of succeed long before we did. But then we came along with four triple platinums in a row, and we kind of drove around them on the racetrack of rock and roll history. And But ultimately, in 81, we both had number one albums, and we were, ironically, after all those years, we were battling for the number one on the charts, and... Uh, and I'll say that year, Ario had the more weeks of number one than we did, but we both got there. And uh, and then, then we didn't work, work together. We hadn't played a show with them probably since the 70s. And all of a sudden, our, we wound up at the same booking agent. And our manager says, you know, they'd love to put a package thing on Ario together. And sometimes you put these things together and, and the bands cancel each other out because it's not the same audience. But somehow six is not way together, particularly in the Midwest. One and one equals three, four, five, six, depending on where we're at. So, right, right, right. And- very good thing. And you guys became friends. How did you become friends with the guys from Cheap Trick? Just because they're from Rockford, another Illinois band? Well, the irony of that is that uh, Robin Zander was actually in a band with my younger brother. Really? For Cheap Trick. And, uh, but Robin didn't drive, so my brother, who was attending Northwestern at the time, would, would drive out and pick Robin up and bring him back in for rehearsal. And my brother finally got fed up with, with driving him back and forth. <laughs> and Robin says to me to this day, he says, your brother fight me, J.Y. <laughs> 
<laughs> my brother just got tired of driving him. And Robin's always had that, you know, I mean, Rick, you'll see Rick at a pizza joint in Bucktown. Yeah. I'll be hanging out at Peace. Robin is more of the rock and roll lifestyle. Very dashing, handsome-looking front man. <laughs> He's got an incredible voice. You know, and, and Nielsen, Nielsen is just kind of every every guy's. He's he's having fun and he's going with it and he's wacky and he hangs with Pete Townsend and right. Nielsen is legendary. He's he's the writing genius there, mm-hmm. and Xander is the singing genius. And together they've you know they've they've made wonderful music together for all these years and uh, surrounded themselves with the likes of you know Tom Peterson and and Bunny. And now recently it's been uh, Rick Sutton on drums. And, right, Dax. Is uh, we, we love those guys, and eventually we'll wind up doing a tour with them. It's just uh, somehow it's, uh, we watch shows with them from time to time and wind up with them, and I always love when we do because it's uh, like old home week and we just kind of reminisce on uh, way back when in the early 70s. Well, I, I told Rick this, and I've said this to Robin too. Talk about a voice that has stood the test of time, and his voice – I think has gotten better the last few years. It's unbelievable how a singer like that can keep his voice all these years. Well, I look to my colleague Tommy Shaw, who really <laughs> put himself through years of abuse through a rock and roll lifestyle, and finally uh, became clean and sober about 20 years ago. And he is—he's the healthiest guy I know right now. You know, he eats healthier than I do, and I'm kind of—I mean, I was kind of got ahead of him, and then he's way ahead of me. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tommy, Tommy is hitting hitting those notes every night in an unbelievable way, and everybody's blown away by it. And Robin's doing the same thing. I think, I think those of us that have survived and decided what we got, if we want to keep doing this for another ten, fifteen years, we got to clean it up and get it straight. So that's what those guys have done. Well, isn't it funny how you know you used to party back in the day, and now everybody's healthy? You got the guys that don't eat meat anymore, the guys that don't drink anymore. It's like you know everybody's healthy as they get older. I, I don't exactly know how to explain it. I'll leave that to someone else, but it. Uh, if you've survived a certain point and you've watched the likes of a John Enwistle die at the beginning of a Who tour yeah. uh, in a very uh, you know sad situation, he was trying to you know still uh, cling to his glorious misspent youth, and it uh, you know backfired. That was uh, one of his key arteries, and that was that. You know that that that's when you watch people dropping around you. That's the wake up call that most of us <laughs> can't ignore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean we lost John Panazzo back in '96. That was a, a terrible, sad tragedy, and there we tried to you know. We had two or three, four or five interventions with him, and but ultimately his best friend was uh, the thing that ultimately got him. So Right. I was just going to ask you about that. You lost John. How does a band get past that? I mean, there's a mourning period. How long did that last for you guys with Styx? Uh, it was our reunion tour in 96. We hadn't worked together in 13 years with Tommy and Dennis and myself together. And uh, But unfortunately, John was not ready to, to meet the call. He just really was not strong enough to be out there on that stage, and so he was we replaced him with Todd Zuckerman and just said, John, you're going to get an equal share minus what we have to pay Todd. And uh, But I think for him that was that was the last nail in his coffin, and they just kind of gave up and uh, died in the middle of while we're out on the road. Man, that is rough. That is rough. Yeah, tough, tough. We're talking with uh, JY of Sticks, and uh, all summer long you're just you're touring. Do you ever get a break where you can just kind of decompress like a week or so? Yeah, I mean, we had we had a 30 days off in a row, uh, March 5th to April 5th this year, and then we, we kind of hit it hard with ourselves, REO, and Mr. Motor City Mad Ted Nugent, and that was uh, a very successful six, seven-week run we did. Someone said that Ted was on Dennis Lizzie the night saying uh, great things about Stick. So, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, Ted, <laughs> Ted's a piece of work, and politically he and I are coming from very different places. But the music is a universal language, and that's how I see this whole thing. I mean, Ted is perhaps outspoken than, than a musician ought to be, but um, that's Ted. And uh, when a man's got loaded firearms and a crossbow, you, you can say too much to him. I was going to ask you about that. He's actually quite skilled with him as well. So Touring with Ted Nugent, I mean, you know, you grew up in Chicago. You're probably a Chicago Democrat. I have no idea. Ted is just a diehard Republican. I mean, do, do you ever talk politics with him? Well, Tommy Shaw was his bandmate for a number of years. Of course, right. So Tommy knows what Ted is and what Ted isn't. And there's the public Ted that is, you know, he is not only the Motor City Madman, but he's a pure mouth extraordinaire. He, you know, nobody can get a word in edgewise. We did a, we did a Rockland interview, which is a syndicated thing that, don't, doesn't get into Chicago anymore, but I mean, you know, it gets about 20 cities across the country to sort of promote the start of this national tour we do. Mm-hmm. And if somebody asks the specific question for Tommy and JY, and Ted says, I'll answer this. And he goes on and says, I know these guys feel this way, so I'll have to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like when he gets gets in a crowd of people, he can't, he can't turn off that part of himself. One-on-one, he and I just had the most amazing conversation about the early days and that he from Detroit, and really Mitch Wright and the Detroit Wheels were like the big thing, and Jim McCarty, 
and Mitch Ryder, those guys uh, really just were great influence on him. He actually jammed with Hendricks, which made me as jealous of him as I've ever been, which because Hendricks is my idol, and I never had an opportunity like that. So, right. I mean, we just, you know, we've got war stories that both go way, way back, and a great mutual respect there, and uh, we've gotten to, you know, to respect each other that much more here in the last couple of years as we've toured together. Well, J.Y., who today would you like to jam with? A lot of people say, you know, uh, Dave Grohl, who really respects the old classic rock artists, They'd love to play well, with Grohl, him. Grohl is a Sticks fan. I mean, his drummer, his drummer was up at a lot of our shows out in L.A. We've never seen Dave there. And I've never met Dave, although when uh, we went to the O2 Arena in London back in 2007, I know he, uh, we were hanging out with Del Upward at that point in time and, uh, and, and Jason Bonham, who was a drummer at Foreigner, which had just toured with us. So, uh, so Dave, I heard Dave Grohl went through the lobby about five minutes before we did, but someone had reported to me that they showed the Foofers on television and he was going through his record collection and Dave Grohl held up a Sticks record. So... <laughs> I know that there's, you know, he's a guy that appreciates all kind of music, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, he's, he seems like he's he's he could be everybody's best buddy. The, that whole thing he did about the one the recording studio where all those great records were made. Right. I've never set foot in it, but he's phenomenal as a drummer. He's phenomenal as a as a composer. He's phenomenal as a a front man, and the energy that guy has, you know, it's it's. Uh, I'd, lo- I'd love to hang with him, yeah. You know, the uh, the remaining members of Nirvana were in Chicago a few weeks ago, and they went to Rick's Pizza Joint and met Rick there, Peace Pizza, mm-hmm. at uh, North and Damon. And those guys were in town. The picture shows up the next day, and I'm like, where's my phone call? <laughs> Somebody forgot to call me. I'm texting the owner, Bill Jacobs. I'm like, hey, Rick's in town? How about a little love here? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> on the outside looking in. <laughs> and uh, it seems like uh, every few times that we talk, you bring up the O2 Arena, and we all look back and say, gosh, what happened to that Led Zeppelin reunion? You as a fan, as a rock star and a fan, how come it just didn't come together? Was it Robert Plant because he doesn't want to put the old days back together or he doesn't want to get together with Paige? What is it? You know, I, I've, I've heard that the Plant is the stumbling block but the actual precise reason that, that he's taken that position, and who knows if my sources are correct, you know, so this is all, this is all conjecture and supposition. Sure. Uh, completely what I'm saying here. Uh, who knows? I mean, you know, maybe he's, he's got too many bad memories, and it's just, you know, there's a part of his life. I mean, I think he lost a child he at did. one point along the way, and there was some talk about, you know, he, this whole, you know, page in his black magic business. Uh, you know, I, I can see that that would leave a, a very, very, very deep scar if, if you actually felt there was a connection. I don't know all the circumstances, and I've not read the story in ages, so I can't even remember. But, you know, I think some, sometimes there's a deep scar that, uh, that people just is, cannot, be, cannot be sutured and healed over. Right. Well, he said that he looks back and listens to that music, and he gets sad because of the death in his life when that happened. And I can understand that. I mean, those, that, that music is a trigger for memories of a bad, bad moments that he's trying to put behind him and, and, and find out who he is now. Right. And, you know, and he's entitled to that. And, uh, you know, they, they, they put on the best show I ever saw him do that night. I think they were all, you know, ready to go, and then he didn't have to save his voice for the next. And he put her all out there, and because he was always, you know, kind of held back, it seems to me when they played live, because they were, you know, hitting notes which are no man should be able to hit. And uh, I understand completely why he would say that, and it's, it's, uh, you know, the fans want to see it, but right. I never thought they were that great live anyway. You know, the their o- legend looms much larger to me than their actual live performances would dictate. But the O2 show, you said it was fantastic. The last time I saw him in Chicago Stadium before the United Center, going back to the 70s, and we actually were in a hotel room probably about a month before Bonham died in, in Germany, and they had played the night before, and, and some of the guys went to see him and what had. But, you know, it, it just, uh, they had, you know, back then they didn't have video screens, and here they had this fantastic thing when they played this video they did to Cashmere, just sort of, and the sound, I love that song. I love that song. And so them playing Cashmere Live with this incredible video thing and these people that came from all over the planet, it all kind of came together for me emotionally and goes, you know, this is a moment that probably, and I know it's captured on DVD and I haven't gone back to watch it in a lot too, but, you know, that, that was a moment like this is, to me, the pinnacle moment for Led Zeppelin in my heart right here. Really? Live, yeah. You know, I, you mentioned that I haven't thought about it. I haven't seen Jason Bond now at, in quite a number of years, but I know he's out there still. So. Right. So, uh, bump in, that'll probably make me want to do it. Talk about a class act, man. That guy is just a class act. I love him. I love Jason. I absolutely love Jason. He 
grew up in the shadow of his dad and had to deal with all that stuff and had his own sort of horrible demons and, and got past them. And uh, I wish him all the best. He's great. He's a good dude. And uh, yeah. so, J.Y., things will start slowing down when? In October for you? You're back in Chicago and we can hang out a little bit? Yeah, yeah. fourth quarter is typically a lot less busy for us. I love it. Well, we're going to be back in uh, – Back in Merrillville and Waukegan between Christmas and New Year's. So uh, those tickets are already on sale. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> it never, ever ends with you. That's why I love it. JY of Sticks. Brother, good to talk to you. Pete, always a pleasure. All right, man. Thanks for coming on. Okay.